Hello, hello everyone. Thanks for sticking around. You're watching BCT Pacific. We are doing our first episode of the weekly recap. I'm Victoria, just to recap. We also have Achilles <laughs> and, it already. and Valdez. Yeah, we're, we're doing this already. Uh, yeah, so the weekly recaps, we're just here to chill with you guys. Uh, we're gonna invite special guests. Uh, over the you know over the course of the next eight weeks and including into playoffs, um, they'll be here. We're gonna have a chit chat with them. Probably make them do weird challenges, and we're just gonna break down some of the, the hot things that happened over the weekend. Uh, this starting off with the first day, we had the Korean dominance. Uh, we also saw a very long game on that same day with uh, Global Esports and T1 um, into it, that went all three games. We even saw our first knife kill, like our first full yeah. Tondo Gaming by Team Secret. Uh, what were some of your favorite moments? Uh, definitely a big fan of the Team Secret uh, win over Talon. I think that was a big turning point in a lot of people's minds for VCT Pacific, where it's like, oh, this is the way it's going to go. It's not just going to be clear cut and dry, and not all the predictions are going to be straightforward. Um, so that was a really big boost, I think, for that scene. I think the 2-1 and both of the map wins being very dominant were a really good sign for Team Secret. So that was fun. I mean, obviously some of our strong teams are really strong and seeing like some high level Valorant is always a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So uh, also enjoyed the stomps as well, personally. Yeah. <laughs> Those are always good. Yeah. How about I, you? I like the when we just turned the stage on for the first time, the, the mm -hmm. intro, finally unveiling it to, to everybody. Like a school counselor, I just saw myself in <laughs> the camera. Uh, I, like, I love, the, I love the, the the opening and the first time that the audience kind of got to to see the stage and you know, activating it as we say at the international events and whatnot. Having the players take to the stage for the very first time, as well as having you know a sold out crowd and, and whatnot here. Um, so that was that was sick for me. That was kind of like the best moment of the week. Finally being able to say, okay, Pacific has begun. We can, because we all know this, you know, but we love to work because we love our job. Yeah. So when you're not casting and you're just sitting at home watching like other esports go on, you're just like, God, I want to get back in the studio. Uh, so it feels great to be back. I mean, you've been on the international stage. How was the setup? Was it ever set up like this before in Korea? Have you seen like the way the stage was set up with the AR and no. all those um, visuals? We've had some like AR stuff in the past across a, a bunch of different esports and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. But the okay. way that the way that we're integrating it for this show, I think is is very unique. The mm -hmm. stage design itself, it feels like you're at one of the international events. Yeah. You know, we've kind of gone above and beyond to just match that style mm -hmm. and have the same kind of. Um, the, the same kind of feel to it, I suppose, with the, the massive LED screens, the way that the lights are, are going crazy and whatnot. Um, so it, it feels like I'm back at an international event, even though I'm right here at home. Uh, it's really cool. I mean, you're right. I, I, I wish sometimes, because I'm usually at the desk, I just want to be inside the audience uh, with the rest of the audience to hear that booming music and that Victoria walkout. cast win. <laughs> <laughs> one day, one day. Uh, let's talk about standings. We're not going to talk about casting. Uh, let's talk about standings. Um, uh, yeah, so we had a lot of uh, unexpected wins, um, you know, coming, I think one learning lesson from all this was that Brazil lock-in wasn't a true indicator of how they would be performing this weekend. And I mean, that was kind of always going to be the case, you know, we go off of lock-in a lot because that's the only taste that we really had of, of the teams and their, and their power levels and whatnot, but just given the format of that tournament, you know, it's a celebration of all of the, the teams in franchising across the world. It's not a double elimination tournament. It's a single limb. You're playing best of threes. Uh, people are going to be going home. So, you know, there was always going to be a lot of chance for upset, a lot of chance for teams not being able to really show off their true potential. And I think that we are kind of seeing that. But we're also seeing an immense amount of growth uh, that has been coming out. Again, have to highlight uh, the, the likes of T1, Team Secret as well, proving themselves after having a pretty easy opponent in Team Liquid, a very tough one in Na'Vi. Um, we're, they're showing their real uh, firepower as well by taking down Talon, Detonation, looking a hell of a lot better after that series over in Sao Paulo, as well as RQ. So I mean, I'm, I'm right there with you. I don't think that we could fully trust in everything that we saw at lock-in, but now is where the foundation starts getting laid for all these teams and we can actually figure out what the rankings look like. Yeah, also, I mean, this is why regular season play is so fun because, yeah, we got to see, you know, first taste this first week, right? And this is, we're yep. going to do this weekly recap and go over a lot of the cool plays, but we're going to get nine weeks of this where it's like every week there's something new, that cool that happened. We didn't just only get to see, okay, like one or two best of uh, threes at lock-in and like, that's all I got to see in my favorite team. No, it's like every single week you can find these guys playing at least one best of three. And that's always a lot of fun. So you're going to see some cool upsets. You're going to see some 
moments where, you know, maybe this team was expected to do really well, they didn't, and then this other team had a, a big uprising, like, late in the season, and all of those, like, kind of full season recaps, like, at the end of it, it's like, oh, our expectations were like this, but we had these really cool uh, differences and changes in our minds, and uh, I'm just looking forward to doing the entirety of this uh, yeah. regular season. You no, know, absolutely. I mean, let's just talk about just now. You know, we won't go into too much uh, detail about this, but we just saw RRQ uh, play against Gen G, and um, that was the first time these two had played against each other uh, it, internationally. Yeah, I mean, two very new organizations, but I don't think that we've had, ever had any of the players from either of these teams clash internationally, mm -hmm. so I think that that was across the board very much a first. Um, and clearly, you know, Gen G fairly well prepared. I mean, we were talking about it at the end of the show. Sylvan saying, "Yeah, well, like, we came out here, we, we just wanted to, we just wanted to win. You know, shoot him in the head, whatever, blah blah blah." <laughs> uh, we mentioned like that can be dangerous. You don't want to underestimate. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we did see RRQ picking up a fair number of rounds uh, across uh, those two maps. Really good starts for them, especially on Fracture with that four-round streak they were able to set up. It's still sucks to see them kind of like end up giving, you know, having that really strong start and then start immediately just dropping round after round after round. 10 consecutive never feels good. I mean, 10 consecutive obviously across both halves, but then dropping the pistol, dropping that uh, that eco round. It's very rough and it's something that needs to be fixed because a we've seen it in the past. There are these teams that can get snowballed on and you need to be able to break the snowball. You mm -hmm. have to stop that enemy momentum um, and then get some back yourself. And I think that that's one of the biggest things I need to work on is just th those fundamentals. Yeah, that's a very good recap. And uh, they didn't really stop it with their second map, Lotus. Uh, with that, I, I kind of want to point out some of the map picks over the last three days. Uh, Lotus is the last map that we had ended on. It seemed to be quite a popular map, actually. Yeah, it's pretty interesting that we get uh, Pearl and Lotus here at the top. Uh, as was mentioned before on the desk by Achilles, like it does seem like a lot of teams, uh, even at Locken, were beginning to pick more Pearl and actually beginning to prioritize this map more than some others. Um, I was happy to see Fracture coming out once again. I actually quite like that map. I think that Genji played it exquisitely well. Uh, up against uh, RRQ and really had their number on that one. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's been pretty good so far. I'm just, you know, waiting for the first split map as yeah. well. Why don't we talk about, <laughs> yeah. like, real quick, why is, is there no split? Happen? Yeah, why is there no split? It, it's hard to say just because I feel like the, the overarching changes to split haven't really altered the identity of the map too, too much. I think the teams just really want to continue to drill it and work around the, the changes that have occurred on the map before they're fully comfortable in playing it. And that also obviously is going to be delayed as you have other agents getting integrated and whatnot. I think it's gonna be some time before we see Gecko, but you wanna be able to run everything and try every single iteration you possibly can before you're willing to go for a map. And that also extends over to agents as we can see. We've lasted this entire week. No one's opted to pick Gecko yet. Yeah, no Gecko at all. Um, and no Chamber, of course. I think we kind of, kind of saw <laughs> like that? the diminishing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We there's so much of him and now there's none of him and there's still none of him. Uh, but Killjoy being the most played. I think there's definitely some meta agents, like obviously <laughs> Killjoy yeah. and Jet coming out a lot. KO is a big mainstay, but uh, I'm sure that eventually we'll get one person who's like, I really like Chamber, we won map one. Get, let me get a shot at it. Maybe I can play really well. Like he still is the same agent, obviously with some big nerfs over the last couple of months. But um, I think it'll happen. Just especially at the beginning of the season, it's like okay, everybody's just gonna play Killjoy and Jet on every single map, and it's not really gonna change. Uh, Killjoy, I guess, having the lead in one map. But um, yeah, I mean, pretty straightforward meta picks so far. Nothing too out of the ordinary. But eventually, someone like Amon is gonna pull out the Reina. I guarantee it. Yeah, I mean. Killjoy, it's it's not shocking, and I, I do agree. I think that we're 100% going to see Reyna before we see Chamber, before we see Gecko. I mm -hmm. feel like that's just, unless somebody really wants to pull, throw uh, a curveball and, and have that, that Gecko coming out, but I think Reyna is a bit more likely. I wouldn't mind seeing it from Emin again because he did play it quite proficiently, um, but we'll have to just wait and see. But I think that for the most part, it's just gonna be those two out of the meta. Everything else is kinda gonna be filtering in, but given the, the strength of Killjoy, even with the recent nerfs, it just hasn't quite done enough because the, the lockdown ult is just still so very valuable. Being able to buy that much space, having it be less reliably eliminated by enemy utility. I mean, it's a fairly heavy commitment. You think about two of the biggest things that can take out that ultimate is a Hunter's Fury as well as a Brim ult, so an orbital strike. And to commit the, both of those just for a singular lockdown obviously feels 
very, very bad. But it's something that you have to do because the lockdown is so strong. So mm -hmm. I think unless something else happens or some kind of new tech is found, um, we're not. I mean, the gecko, <laughs> you can destroy it with a mosh pit, but well, that would require, puddle. we're gonna need to see people play around with some crazy lineups <laughs> in order to make that sure. happen, you know, on, on common Killjoy spots. So, I mean, I'm curious if somebody will decide to do that. Um, it's just, we have to give it a little bit more time, let the teams cook and, and see when the time is right to, mm -hmm. to take it out of the oven, I suppose. All right, well, let's also talk about our MVP picks, because we had a good discussion about this over the last few days, and we uh, came to a conclusion about a couple of them. Uh, one guy mm. for me that stood out uh, a little bit differently than your standard, like amazing, uh, you know, multi kills was Devai. He really uh, brought these amazing moments, moments where Paper X should have lost. And he was the last man standing and completely clutched the round um, in 1v3 uh, type situations. Yeah, I mean, for me, I was actually going for Ben Kai on this one. I mm. think that across both maps in the series, Ben Kai was instrumental. He's obviously also the IGL. So you have that unsung, uncalculable uh, buff and, you know, that in a statistic that you kind of need to rope into uh, the overall team play, keeping everybody steadied when you are in that situation, like on Lotus versus TFM, where it was looking like they were going to drop the map. But Devai was the one who kind of put, uh, I was going to say pencil to paper, but gun to head. Uh, mm -hmm. against the DFM members and just knocked them down one after the other. Every single round uh, on the back end of that map, he was the one who was clutching up to be able to get the wins. And then obviously Meteor, a most recent one that gets tacked on there uh, with just another incredible performance. So I don't think that really any of the ones that we have up there, I agree, I think maybe Dubai is the, the one that people would have expected a little bit less. Because mm. normally going to a PRX series, you probably think it's going to be Forsaken, yeah. Jing, you know, maybe even Ben Kai as I had the vote yeah. for. But um, I mean, Dubai came up huge and he showed like, yeah, I, uh, I deserve to be on this team. So screw you naysayers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he. Uh, it was it was cool to see him popping up there. Uh, I was impressed by Envy as well. I, I think from yesterday he was a huge re part of the reason why the team was able to essentially have that consistency across many rounds. Like uh, part of the reason why I feel like uh, the wins from Team Secret were so dominant was because he was getting consistent, you know, multi kills and stuff like that. So that was cool to see. Uh, I also really liked Meteor, you know, just from today. Maybe I'm biased because this is the day I was working, <laughs> but like he just kind of made both maps about him. Like his raise on Fracture was, you could not ignore him. Even though like we were first looking at TS on his team and then we were looking at King and we we're like, okay, these two guys are probably going to be the two guys we highlight. And then Meteor's like, no, it's it's me actually again. I'm, I'm back. And he did it again on Lotus as well. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of biased towards those players that are like, okay, I'm just going to take over the entire lobby. And he did yeah. exactly that today but again i mean you, you gotta you still have to give that shout out to the the rest of the team functioning around him to uh, enable him to do that it does mm -hmm. kind of feel almost like a classic optic and yay mm -hmm. situation where it's just like let's enable sure. this guy to go ahead and, and run rampant and i mean you take a look at god dead's statistics at the end of it the number of assists that he had was enormous i think he was almost averaging an assist per round throughout that entire set so uh great to see god dead back and just really helping meteor pop off as we have come to know and love from him yeah. Well, let's actually uh, go into a couple of those highlights, um, these pop and off highlights. Uh, some of our favorite moments. Uh, one of my favorite moments was, you know, on day one uh, with DRX versus Zeta. This was a big one when you have Korea versus Japan, this longtime rivalry. Uh, it was a really exciting game. I know a lot of the Japanese audience was tuning into this. Um, but DRX was playing so well, and one person that really um, made it extra exciting was the addition of Foxy9. It was the first time we'd seen Foxy9 actually play live uh, with the team. He hasn't yet an appeared until this moment. Um, he had a reputation for maybe getting a little early stage jitters. Uh, but then he really warmed up and proved himself getting like triple uh, multi kills and ending the game with a really insane ace. A beautiful, clean ace. Yeah, I mean, we've always known that Foxy9 has just uh, amazing mechanics. We've seen it from him, but it's always been a show. Match, so it's never been on a VCT stage. We all obviously know that DRX was looking at having him implemented into the roster by the time that Rocket came around, but they decided we needed a little bit more time. And even in this matchup, it wasn't necessarily like, okay, this is the game plan. Buzz, for personal reasons, he wasn't able to attend. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we, in all likelihood, we're going to be seeing Buzz competing 
in this match for Seseda. But Foxy, he rose to the occasion. He did have those early jitters. We saw that roughness, a couple whiffs at the beginning of the map. But as time went on, he just started dominating. He ends things off with an ace. It's just a perfect cherry on top for him in that debut. Uh, and I, I, I can't help but feel like he, he was probably so relieved after just getting yeah. that win under his belt and popping off as hard as he did. Yeah, also for any naysayers, he's like, it's done and dusted. And I, I feel like that was a great way to start. Um, with something kind of fresh and new, and I really enjoy that. So what was your, your favorite, uh, Seth? For me, this might surprise some people, and granted, I kind of surprised myself, rather DFM surprised <laughs> me, because for me, it is the DFM versus Paper Rex series. That, uh, this was kind of my, my highlight for the week. I think this, especially second map, we'll focus in on that. Lotus yeah. was where uh, I was very caught off guard with how clean DFM was looking. So Jess in particular oh was absolutely destroying with this race. The number of kills that he was putting up, despite the fact that this ended up being a loss, was monumental. So I got to give it to this because it was an, a completely unexpected banger match, one that we didn't anticipate. We thought, okay, Paper X, they're obviously going to be contending within like the top four, top five teams here in Pacific. DFM probably hovering around the bottom. This should be clean and easy. And again, DFM nearly ended up taking this map for themselves. So just, just at every moment was looking incredible. You had Anthem as well, finding an ace for himself, a second ace of the tournament at this point after Foxy Nines. And it was just an awesome back and forth between these two squads with Paper Rex and again, credit to Divai, barely scraping by with the win to close it out 2-0. Yeah. Yeah, how, how did you find this game, Brendan? I mean, you can just see from the highlights, like, uh, this Lotus map was so hype, it was so back and forth. Like, to, to see this clutch moment at the end from Devai as well, just barely able to clear out the site, and uh, against all odds, essentially, I think it was like a 2v4, they were able to just get the, the defuse off, so... Uh, it's really cool stuff, like you could see that Paper X were the team that uh, essentially at the end of the day did deserve to take the win, but BFM did not make it easy for them. And uh, I had another match which I, I thought was really interesting, obviously a big one that a lot of us voted for Talon. We were like, okay, they had a great result at um, uh, lock-in recently in Brazil, so they should be able to take this. Well, Team Secret had a different idea, and it started out with Talon's uh, dominance, you know, winning the pistol round, starting off very well. Um, but then all of a sudden, you kind of get double back-to-back -back clutched by Borkum, who's, you know, not even like the biggest name on the roster, but you're like, oh, uh-oh, like, well, what's going on here? Like, this guy's just gonna pop off this hard against us. This is the first one. And then he does another one on the, uh, on the A side as well, which is uh, really beautiful, this one here. And it's just crazy because from there, the entire momentum and the entire story of the series, I feel like, uh, totally shifted. Yeah, I mean, it was really good early reads, as you were saying, from Talon. This, unfortunately, for Cruz, just getting timing, just shifting back, doesn't see anything on that approach from Tree. Borkham just strikes at the perfect moment. So they really started finding their groove and, and just really working around Talon, running circles around them. But Talon did have those good early reads. It was looking like that was going to be a much more competitive map. Um, but fortunately, the series was overall competitive in that it went to that 1-2 that scoreline for Talon in the loss. But clearly, things that need to be fixed, maybe some change-ups as well for their fracture, because mm -hmm. as we were talking about on the desk, just at the beginning of the show, during the pre-show, uh, Secret studied the ever-loving hell out of their playbook, and they were just able to really lay it all out there and just shut them down. Yeah, I mean, that, that fracture map was was brutal. Um, really interesting plays uh, by by both sides. Um, I really like that you like all the understated players and kind of who rise up and surprise yeah. us. And I, I'm expecting a lot more of that coming into next week. Um, you know, we talked a bit about RRQ and their performance today, and they get to go up first. Uh, next week um, on Saturday against Zeta, so it's almost like their redo, um, and, and we can see how, how they can do. I'm particularly excited, I mean, this is gonna be very obvious, but very excited uh, for the Paper Rex versus Team Secret uh, game right there, front and center. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, Philippines versus, uh, you know, Singapore, Malaysia. Uh, both of these teams had such a strong showing, and um, having them come head to head uh, next week is gonna be Fantastic. I imagine just so much um, enthusiasm from, from the Valorant fans too. Yeah, I mean, we heard from Jesse Bash in his, his winner's interview just yesterday. He was saying, you know, Paper Rex has always been our team to beat within, you know, the APAC region, within Southeast Asia. It's always Paper Rex because mm. DRX isn't included. Otherwise, if, if DRX is in the mix, they say like, okay, yeah. we need to be able to beat them. Um, but there is this long-standing, you know, 
want to, to overthrow Paper X since they have often been the representative, since Team Secret was not present at international events in 2022. So they want to basically reclaim that spot that they, they had established for themselves all the way back at Champs of 2021, where they were able to make it out of that group stage, make it into the playoffs. So I think that this is going to be super exciting because Paper X, they do look like they're still, despite the 2-0 victory, on a little bit of a dip. They're still trying to figure out certain things. They need to tighten up certain aspects of play. Again, Forsaken playing that Yoro and Lotus as if it is a jet and oftentimes getting a little bit frazzled. I mean, you see that in that Anthem ace where he just keeps, he's like two feet to the left and Anthem just pulls out a classic and kills him. So there's things that still need to be fixed from the side of Paper X. And Team Secret in the meantime is just looking better and better. Um, you know, from lock-in into this into this tournament already. So I think that that's going to be an awesome set because Paper X, aside from beating DRX, this is probably like one of the other teams that they really desperately want to be mm -hmm. able to take down, just given that regional rivalry. Yeah, I imagine that uh, coming into this one, Team Secret's able to start off the uh, season 2-0. Like that could happen against uh, all odds, essentially. Like yeah. these these teams have fought each other a lot, Team Secret and, and Paper X, but like. Are they the favorites coming into that matchup? I don't really know. Like before the season really started, I would have said Paper X, but after what we saw this week, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I think there is a lot of, um, and the fandom is definitely shifting around as these different teams come uh, face to face with each other. We also have a really exciting T1 and Talon game uh, next week. With that, thank you for joining us for this week's uh, episode one of BCT Pacific. Uh, see you guys next week. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>